We'll give that a try. Okay. <laughs> Set it down. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Hands, hands. Do you like hands or hands? Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> John, John, John. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> No immunity. No immunity, right? Just, uh, How's that? That's good. Back there okay? All right. Well, um, in our few minutes left, let's think a little bit, uh, let's continue with Ecclesiastes and think a little about, about some implications for pastoral care. This will be very brief. There's a lot more to say, but it'll get a, an introduction for us, something to keep talking about. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We ask for ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll just remind you of something you already know. Imagine if you uh, came to hear someone preach, and the preacher stood up the pulpit, and after he prayed, he paused. And then he said in a very loud voice, Meaningless! It's all meaningless. You know? And then he started quoting some poetry. And then he started to tell you about his feelings. And then he said in a very loud voice, maybe down on his, like this, I hate life. <laughs> well, you know what would happen? Uh, <laughs> The elders would be gathering in the back, right? <laughs> and uh, we would think that the preacher has lost it. He's gone mental. He needs some help. And uh, it probably says a lot about us that we would think about that way in light of such a sermon. I want to remind you that... Um, uh, if we believe that Ecclesiastes is the inspired, inerrant, authoritative Word of God, then uh, the voice that's being given to us in Ecclesiastes um, is inspired by God, which means these are God's words. What's it, what's it like for you to imagine that God would say, I hated life? That, that God would uh, call upon his spokesperson to use this language. Uh, for, for many of us, it might be unnerving. Uh, we're not accustomed to this kind of preaching. Um, but uh, for anyone in the, in, in the thick of pain, to know that the preacher understands what it is to feel the meaninglessness or the grief of life can be a remarkable, caring, human, empathetic reality. Uh, we, don't, we don't expect God talkers to talk like this. Uh, we expect God talkers to rebuke us quickly if we talk like this. Remind us of promises, tell us everything will be okay, call us back to faith. Um, but what if, what if this preacher speaks because of faith? 
What if his language is on the basis of his faith in God that he talks like this when he looks at the world? I suggest that is what's happening. It's out of the fear of the Lord that he speaks this way, not in spite of it or in opposition to it, but because of it. And there's a, a season for everything under heaven. And there is a season in which God talks like this for the sake of his people. And he gives preachers who can feel and be human enough to admit what it's like to be in a fallen world. So, number one, under the sun. Uh, remember, under the sun is, uh, was once Eden. It's the earth God created. It's the place uh, where he walked in the cool of the day with them. And they had each other and they had a place to live and they had work to do and the goodness of God. No wonder, you see, no wonder he steps out and surveys everything under the sun in light of what it was created to be. No wonder he laments. Someone has once said that every lament is a love song. If Ecclesiastes is a, is a lament, what does it reveal to you about what the preacher loves? Under the sun. He laments what it was, what it is, longs for what it's meant to be. And in our pastoral care, we enter life with people and we are meant to learn how to lament with what is. Not just quick fix reminders about what it's supposed to be. I feel this very keenly right now because uh, uh, while I'm here, I'm, a, I'm a still a pastor of a congregation in the States and you know, I in the emails and uh, every day, right? And reality is going on, the lives of people that I love. And, and a, a young couple just had their first child. And there's complications. And the child's been diagnosed with Turner Syndrome, one week old. And the prognosis of the child's future has a lot of grimness to it. I ask you a question. If you were at, on the other side of the world, let's say you were in St. Louis, and a, a, a young couple in your congregation here in New Zealand just got that news, and you couldn't call them, all you had was email, what would you say? And it's in moments like that, I'm thankful that God gives us a preacher like this. I, I, don't, I don't have to pretend that they're supposed to be happy. Do you know? There's a time to mourn. And we get to. For the glory of God. Sometimes someone needs to cry with all their heart for the glory of God because some things are just worth crying about when you know what we were created for and what we actually have to face. Under the sun reality. Second idea, thinking about a category for pastoral care, is Ecclesiastes itself. Um, think about this for a moment. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job. Proverbs are the, the norms. What if you think about Ecclesiastes as the exceptions? And Job as the illustration of both in action. Proverbs, the norms. I, uh, when I was in school learning English, we, you know, you learn all the rules for grammar and you, you, you start to feel good about it or learning some language, Greek or whatever language you're learning, right? 
You, you, and then someone comes along, a New Testament professor who teaches Greek. He, he comes along and then he says, all right, you're doing great. Now we need to start learning the exceptions to the rules. <laughs> you know, in English it's something like I before E except after C. Some, something about neighbors and way. I don't remember. <laughs> Sometimes why? I don't know. It's a Friday night and it's late and I'm not immune. So, but some kind of exception, right? And uh, so the Proverbs are the, the, the norms, like the, the normative sort of way that thing is supposed to be. So good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to people gone bad, right? So when Job's friends uh, encounter Job, in some ways, you know, they're just responding to proverbial norms. Job's got a lot of bad stuff going on. Job must be the cause of it. I know there's a timeline in terms of when these things are written and all. But as these proverbs are being collected, this normative way of looking at Job. You ever thought about what it would be like to be Job's pastor? I mean, you get the call, right? And he's just sitting there, having just lost everything dear to him. What's your go-to verse? You know? So... So those, those guys in Job, I, I think, you know, I think on the surface of it, you know, they're, they're applying truisms to a situation they've not bothered to learn about. Ecclesiastes comes out the other way. I've seen a righteous man perish like the wicked, and the wicked uh, prosper like the righteous. Exceptions to the rule. And so in our pastoral care, what does that do? Well, it reminds us that those fellows in the book of Job, they got it right at the beginning when they didn't say much. Have you noticed that? If you've been around a while and you're in the midst of pastoral care for people, that a lot of times it's our Christ-centered silences more than our sentences that really matter in those moments. We're, pre we're just present. I, uh, this Earlier this year, we have a lot of young couples with young, having young children in our congregation. And a young couple who I love very much, they had a child, and that child died two months old. And there we are in the uh, emergency room, hospital room. You know what it is, those of you who are in pastoral ministry. There you are in the hospital emergency room and you arrive and the father is holding the baby who has already died. Holding her body. Just looking. And the wife is leaned in just crying. And I'm asking you, what's your go-to verse? What, what sentence from the Professor, when you learned what class are you going to say there? You know what I mean? And uh, we are brought to the fact, we're humbled to the fact that we, we don't have immunity, that we don't, ha we don't have all the charm and the stuff, and it doesn't matter how big or small our church is in that moment or how many books we have or haven't written in that moment. It doesn't mean a hill of beans. What matters in that moment is the grace of God for those people, right? We don't say much. All I could get out was, I love you. And then I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man uh, crying like a man. And uh, Joe, uh, the, 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 the preacher in Ecclesiastes, he's giving us language out of fear of the Lord to be able to 
walk into the exceptions. This matters for us, doesn't it? Shepherding in a post-Christian context. I mean, I don't, I don't know about each of your contexts, but in mine, uh, people have been hurt by guys like me. They've been hurt by pastors and burned by them and really leery of Christian people and Christianity. And uh, so for them to risk, you know, church, it's a big, it's a step of human courage on their behalf. And, excuse me, isn't it? Isn't the reason we hurt people because we forget about Ecclesiastes and Job and we just sort of come at it like everything's a formulaic proverb? And isn't God so different than us that he wrote Ecclesiastes and Job alongside of Proverbs? So you got Proverbs, then you got Psalms. Ecclesiastes, Job, and the psalmist just pouring out the whole range of human emotion to the Lord in prayer. Job, the, the, the Bible talkers, you know, the, the comforters using truth like a hammer, uh, not knowing about exceptions. Ecclesiastes, giving us language for under-the-sun realities that does not pretend and is not trite. All of that effort <laughs> to make sure Proverbs is surrounded. <laughs> you know. Maybe we need that much of a reminder, you know, of, of what happens in a life under the sun. Uh, have you ever noticed this in yourself? Um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I've preached sermons like this. And I've talked like this before, probably to my kids too, probably to my wife too, where basically, you know, David, King David, uh, he, it's, it's in the day when battles are fought, and uh, he's, he stayed home in a time of war, and he's looking out over the rooftops, and he sees Bathsheba bathing, right? And we will say, you know, uh, David should have been uh, where he was supposed to be, and because he wasn't, he did what he wasn't supposed to. So you don't do that either. Be where you're supposed to and do what you're supposed to. Right? Um, David, he, he shouldn't have done that. But the real problem for us, you see, is David already did do that. So now what? So for a lot of us in our pastoral care, we're going to be no help to David. Because we're going to be talking about things he's already bypassed. We're going to be telling him you shouldn't do it. Yeah, okay, but I already did. Well, you shouldn't do it. Okay, but it's done. And we just keep saying you shouldn't. So some other church comes along who understands something about the gospel. And understands it's for people who've already done what they shouldn't have done. And points David to a Savior. I think when Nathan comes to David and says, you're the man. David isn't invited into a life where he's not an adulterer. David is invited to a life as an adulterer. Solomon, we're all nervous. We all get nervous uh, about Solomon. Because he talks about alcohol and concubines. And part of our nervousness is working hard to make sure <laughs> we say Solomon wasn't as drunk as we think he might have been or Solomon didn't have as much sex with all of his wives as we think he... <laughs> <laughs> Why do we work so hard to get people to be what if they, if, if, they, if they were that, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. You know, like the, the whole reason Jesus came was not for the righteous, but for the sick. And so sometimes in pastoral care, if we're only proverbial, only the norms and formulas, only the oughts and shoulds, then uh, if we're only that, we just hurt people 
And you know what? We're not being honest. Is that too straightforward? I mean, we're not being honest with ourselves. What our, what our spouses experience from us, who we are, who no one else is around, our own uh, struggles and realities. We, we need a Savior. We're not immune. We need a Savior. So in Ecclesiastes, you just get this overwhelming reality of under the sun and lament. And I wonder if that's why these books of the wisdom literature are set the way they are. And Job's friends and Job become an illustration of them in some way. And it becomes an illustration for us in our pastoral care. One more thought. And then the poor wise man to close. One more thought is seasons, right? When you walk pastoral care, when you walk through Ecclesiastes, there's a season for everything, right? The disquiets and the delights. Some people that we pastor always want to focus on the delights. It's a time to be born. It's a time to dance. It's a time to build. It's a time to love, you know? And uh, they have a problem like we just described. And they need help to know that even in rejoicing, there can be sorrowing. And uh, we not only rejoice with those who rejoice, but we weep with those who weep, right? But then it cuts across the other way. Some of us, uh, if you ask us about life, we're always saying there's a time to die. There's a time for war. There's a time for tearing down, you know? And uh, we're the melancholy sort. We just only see every bad thing that could happen. I love tramping in New Zealand. I'm a melancholy guy that imagines bad things. You know, (laughs) tramping in the states where we are, you got snakes and mosquitoes and bears and small cougars that could just rip your throat out and stuff like that. (laughs) So about halfway through our tramp, I'm just starting to just relax. I'm thinking, huh, I could fall off a ridge here, but nothing's going to eat me in the, you know. So some of us need help because we're only, only sorrowing. And in Christ, there does come a non-trite, palpable rejoicing. There are moments to gather that way, and we're helping people do that. And I'd like to suggest to you that sometimes in our pastoral care, it can help us if we Listen long enough to ask the Lord this question. What season is this person in? Because they might be in a, in a time to tear down and, we're, uh, and to mourn, and we're, we're telling them they should dance. You know? A reflection of our circumstance rather than theirs. You know, you ever notice, I mean, for myself, how much... <laughs> My pastoral care has to do with how insecure I am. So if I'm feeling uncomfortable, rather than going to the Lord with my discomfort, I start talking to try to fix something over here so that I'll feel better, which isn't pastoral care at all. That's just personal insecurity. (laughs) So sometimes to to sit and listen with Christ-centered silence is long enough to determine what kind of season someone's in. And here's why. Because it's true, a person may need to pray. But prayer feels differently and looks differently when it's a time to mourn than it does when it's a time to dance. Have you ever tried to pray in the depths of grief? It's different than a happy day. Out in, the, out in the bush with the moon and the clear blue sky and the southern cross. For me, praying like that's not so hard. Or in the midst of a, you know, pray, praying at, uh, if you're a mom, praying uh, and, you, and you're at home with your kids, praying at 7 a.m., and then praying at 7 p.m.? 
I know our husbands judge you, but you've had a long day. And prayer just feels and looks different, doesn't it? For people who have no immunity at 7 p.m. Why are the seasons given to us? So that we recognize where we are and what people are facing and we respond accordingly. Within that, sometimes, you'll notice in pastoral care, sometimes people are having a bit of trouble because they've entered a new season and they don't know it yet. So they're trying to relate in the new season the way they used to relate in the old season. It's not working. They need help to adjust. So I'm thinking about a family. The last of their kids just moved, just went to college. They're now uh, an empty and that's just the two of them, husband and wife, right? Well, everything begins to change. Parenting changes. The way they love each other and spend their day changes. And at first, it might feel a little uncomfortable and they're not quite what to do about it. And they come and talk to you. And you could diagnose some profound spiritual problem that they may or may not be having, but it could be as simple as you're in a new season and this is weird. You, it, 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 it's a new season of discipleship for you. No wonder you feel off and, you know, and uh, helping someone navigate those seasons. So there's a little bit with our time. Pastoral care under the sun. Uh, the juxtaposition of the wisdom literature books and seasons. And I close here. The paradigm. <laughs> One of the paradigms for a uh, Maybe a pastor in Ecclesiastes is a little story that is told. It's a story told about a pretentious king who wants to take over a city. And uh, there's a poor wise man in the city. And the poor man, by his wisdom, outsmarts the king and delivers the city. And the city is victorious. And then Solomon says, and the city forgot all about it. The poor wise man. I think two things about that. Well, three. The first one is it's quite sad. But the second thing is that can be a helpful image for some of you. The, what you envision your life will be as a pastor doing small overlooked things over a long period of time. Some of us will deliver whole cities and no one will ever talk about it. But the Lord will. The Lord will remember. It's a frightening thing to pray George Whitfield's prayer. Let the name of Whitfield perish. That found, sounds very noble until you're in, unless God intends to answer that prayer, <laughs> which he seems to have done for Whitfield for 200 years. We all know about Wesley. The poor wise man delivered a city. He was forgotten by the people of the town because they did not know how to value wisdom nor poverty. But in Ecclesiastes, that guy is a hero. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And after all, isn't that a picture of Jesus? Isn't he the poor wise man who delivered the city in his poverty? He was overlooked and forgotten. And didn't he do that for you and for me? Let's pray. Lord, in these few moments, we've, we've set a, a handful of categories. We're looking at them from this text, and we ask that you would steer us clear of misreading or misinterpreting, grant us solid footing for the shepherding that our own hearts need and the pastoral care that others need. And we set that before you in Jesus' name. Amen.